Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm joined by our Secretary of the Department of Health, Kim Malsam Reisdom, and I also want to thank the President and the Vice President and HHS uh, for all their hard work recently. I had a two hour phone call with other governors today with the Vice President, talked about testing and supplies, and I appreciate all of their efforts. They also are sending us a shipment of remdesivir. It's an antiviral medicine, antiviral medicine for our very worst cases. Uh, supplies will be coming in later this week, and we really do appreciate them. Uh, sending us a shipment that we will be able to utilize. Uh, I want to touch base on Smithfield. Smithfield is reopening. That's good for all of those who want to get back to work and also for our pro producers uh, and our state. I was able to talk with members of the workforce on two different occasions last week. It was a very good, uh, thoughtful discussion, and I appreciated them taking the time to be on the call. Uh, I also want to thank the team at Lutheran Social Services for their language specialists and the services that they provided. Um, they were so professional and wonderful, and we just want to thank them for being available to facilitate the conversation, and I look forward to more in the future. I do want to give a final update on the mass testing numbers of what we conducted down in the Sioux Falls area last week. We had 3,628 people that were tested. It was all voluntary, and we had already tested 1,000 people in that area previously. The preliminary results are that about 24% of the people were positive, or approximately 870 people. On May 6th, uh, before the testing numbers started to come in, we had 773 cases and 72 hospitalizations. Today, we have 1,393 cases and 78 in the hospital. Uh, so we had more active cases, and that's because we tested a hot spot, uh, and that's gone up. But again, it reminds us that what we need to focus on is hospitalizations. Uh, that's what our projections have been based around. That's what our planning has been for, and it's good to see that that number is staying fairly significant even though we do have more active COVID-19 cases in the state. I really want to thank Avira, uh, the Department of Health, the National Guard, and the CDC for helping to make that a very successful four-day event. And my request is for those in, in South Dakota and in that area to still continue to be smart, to practice social distancing, to wash your hands, stay home when you're sick, and to remember, again, that we're going to be doing this for many more weeks. Uh, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And I did want to take the opportunity today to have uh, the Secretary of Health visit a little bit about the work that they have been doing with Demcoda up in Aberdeen. Uh, I think that it has been a helpful, cooperative effort, and it would be good for her to share a few details of what's going on in that area. Thank you, Governor. So from time to time, we've updated uh, folks on the number of cases that we've had associated with employees of the Demcota beef plant up in Aberdeen. Um, right now, that stands at about 76 cases um, that we have over the past three and a half weeks. Um, when we first saw cases in this uh, particular, with this employer, we uh, immediately reached out, and the Demcota management has been excellent to work with. Um, we were able to get a team up to Aberdeen on a Friday night and uh, walk through the facility, um, talk about some of the plans that, that the management had to help keep people safe and for us to get a better sense of kind of some of their practices and to be able to provide some, some technical assistance to help them uh, navigate through this, uh, through this scenario. We've done a couple of site visits since then and um, have worked with the management there. Um, they've done great things. They are uh, doing symptom checks twice a day uh, with their workforce. They've installed uh, physical barriers um, between workstations to help protect folks. Um, we've been able to provide some PPE, and they now have masks and face shields for all of their employees who need them. Um, there's also testing available for um, any uh, potential employees or their family members in the community. And so both Avera and Sanford have, have stepped up and have made testing available. And so um, the daily contacts that we've been able to have with this facility, I think, um, are a great example of the partnerships that we strive to have um, within the state of South Dakota, both between our department and other agencies as, and, and employers across the state. So um, my pitch to everybody listening today is um, if you have questions, if you're an employer, please reach out to us. We have help available. 
Um, we're available to um, walk through what your scenario is and, and give advice, help point you to things that are going to help keep your business safe and keep your workers safe. Um, and as a result, well, I hope that we'll see less COVID cases in the future. But a real shout out to our friends at De Demcota Beef, as well as the city of Aberdeen. The, the mayor there and his team have been great, um, very proactive and just wanting to do the right thing. And so um, those are good examples of how we can work together to manage this response. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate that. I also want to give you a quick update on a couple of executive orders. The executive order regarding vulnerable individuals in the Minnehaha and Lincoln County areas is going to lapse today. Uh, we've had many conversations with the hospital systems, with local officials in that area and in Sioux Falls, and we all feel that it's appropriate at this time to let it lapse, but if we need to revisit again in the coming days, we certainly will. I want to remind those folks, though, that if they can stay home, uh, they sure uh, would be advised to do that. Um, just because the executive order is lifted doesn't mean that the risk is gone, so still continue to be smart and practice social distancing. I've signed also an executive order today uh, to give some more flexibility to businesses as it relates to licenses and financial statements. Uh, details of that can be found on covid.sd.gov. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to any questions you might have. Governor Noem, can you hear me? This is Ariel with the uh, Governor Noem, This is Ariel with the Journal. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Ariel. Okay. Hi. Um, and Happy Mother's Day. Um, oh, thank you. Related. Um, what I wanted to ask is, um, with the checkpoint issues. So the state is saying that the tribes are not following federal law since they haven't consulted and come to an agreement with the state. But the state also says that it needs unobstructed access to state and U.S. highways for through traffic. Unobstructed uh, checkpoints by their nature require people to stop. So asking for unobstructed access seems like you're seems like you can't have checkpoints. So which is it? Is the state saying tribes are not willing to negotiate or has is the state saying we do not want any checkpoints on U.S. and state highways? Well, what we really need to see happen is that we need people that are just driving through the area to be able to do so. We need to be able to get the property owners to their property, ranchers to their cattle. Uh, we need to let essential services through the area, allowed road crews to come in and do maintenance where available, and we have to allow emergency services to come through. So all of that, uh, those deliveries of gas, medical supplies, and food are incredibly important um, to make sure that we have that facilitated through these areas. And are you sure so that they're not happening on either of the reservations? Because they both say that you know, they're allowing through traffic, they're allowing essential services. Um, ranching is considered a essential service, in, uh, at least for the Ogallis Sioux Tribe. I mean, are you hearing that this isn't happening? Yeah, I am getting reports from travelers, from businesses, ranchers in the area, and those mm -hmm. within uh, DOT and other state agencies that, that these checkpoints have been an issue with allowing those types of services to get through. Okay, thank you. You bet. Hi, uh, Governor Nome. This is Dominique Smith from New Center One. How are you? Good. Um, I have another question regarding the checkpoint. Sure. So what communication has the state had with the tribe? Um, because the tribes are saying that they have had some communication with the state and they've been very clear about what they were going to be doing with these checkpoints. So what, what kind of discussions have been had and what do you consider uh, the tribe fulfilling uh, the consultation that's needed uh, to approve these plans? Yes, we have had conversations with the tribes, um, and it's been going ongoing, I would say, for approximately a month. Uh, Friday wasn't the start of the situation. It had been going on with several different conversations, and um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to come to a point where we can allow these types of services to move through these checkpoints and to get some uh, decisions made as to how to go forward. Uh, because we need to continue to see those essential services move through the checkpoints. We need to be able to get ranchers to their cattle, people to their property, and to make sure that we're allowing people who want to travel through the area to continue to do so and not be stopped and turned around. And based on your understanding of the meetings that were held, uh, do you believe that's not being done on their side? Did they ever express that that was not going to be the case, that they were not going to be letting these essential services into the tribes? 
or uh, you know, did they give you a, a uh, criteria of who would and would not be allowed past those checkpoints? Yes, there have been conversations as to what the checkpoints would be doing, and I've personally communicated with Chairman Frazier. He's shared with me through uh, texting of, of the checklists that he would give those that were manning these checkpoints. Um, but I would say that the stories and what's happening on the ground appears to be different. So that's what we're hoping to rectify. Okay, thank you. This is Alex Porto with the Black Hills Pioneer. Okay, we'll go to the Black Hills Pioneer on the phone and then we've got a question in the room too. Thank you. Uh, so the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe uh, started putting up their checkpoints on April 3rd and the memorandum put out by the DOI um, wasn't put out until April 8th. Um, does that affect, does that timeline affect the legality of the situation? And if these checkpoints are illegal, why has it taken a month for any legal action to be taken? You know, I think we've had ongoing conversations with the tribes hoping to see some kind of resolution. Uh, and that's still what I would hope to see. Let's go to okay, a question does, in the Does the timeline of the memorandum have any bearing on the legality of, it, of the situation? Uh, I, w I believe that uh, for U.S. highways and state highways, uh, there is federal jurisdiction, and that's what the state is hoping to clarify, is that um, we are allowing essential services to happen on these roads. Uh, the, uh, we've, I've communicated um, and with Chairman Frazier and also other members of the state government have communicated with uh, other tribal government and entities and individuals that, that what they would do on BIA roads uh, might have different jurisdictional issues and preferences for them than U.S. and state highways. So that's what we're hoping to come to a resolution on. Okay, thank you. Uh, a quick a point of clarification mm -hmm. on the road. Um, are you taking legal action against them now or are you still trying to negotiate? We're taking action to, obviously conversations would still like to be ongoing, uh, but we will be taking action so that we can get some clarity as to how to move forward. Some Democrats in Congress, they uh, are promoting this plan to give uh, individuals $2,000 per month uh, through during the COVID pandemic. And I'm going to assume that you don't think that's a good idea. But what do you think that either state or federal government should or can do to help individuals during this time? Well, what I've been asking for uh, out of the federal government is flexibility in how we utilize the dollars that they've already sent us. Uh, that would allow us, because the state government right now is on the front lines of response to the virus and it's spread across our state, that would allow us to uh, put money into response, to caring to individuals, to making sure that families can get through these difficult times, and then still make sure that we're able to fund important agencies that are taking care of individuals and families, such as the Department of Social Services, such as the Department of Human Services and Health. Um, there's so many of these areas that uh, that state budget is looking impacted by the economic downturn. Um, but we're going to still be required to deliver services to people in the state of South Dakota when they face challenging times and giving us the ability to utilize some of the federal money to respond to those folks that might be in crisis would be very helpful. I know that they've done a lot already on unemployment um, and on uh, stimulus dollars that would go to individuals in the state. Um, we continue to see increases in requests for help and we've done that through small business loans, economic development, workforce training. Those are all areas that I would love to respond to people's needs, but I don't have the dollars to do it today. Another question in the room or on the phone? Mike Tanner from KWAT Watertown. Sure, go ahead, Mike. A question for Kim, if I could, please. Um, Kim, the governor cited the, the mass testing numbers at Smithfield with the 24% positive out of over 3,600 people tested. How would you um, characterize those numbers in terms of 
if they're high or low or maybe about what you expected going into the mass testing. And then secondly, the governor has mentioned that because of this mass testing, there would be an initial spike in numbers statewide. But now that that testing has been done and these people who have ties to the hot spot have been identified, what's the long-term gain that we're going to see from this mass testing and how soon could we see it? Um, well, thank you for those questions. I think the long-term gain is whenever we can test people and uh, help folks that are positive um, isolate and stay away from other people, we help slow down that spread of the disease. So that's why we do these kinds of events. Um, again, testing, um, you know, we're doing a targeted approach so that we're making smart use of our resources. We'll continue to see mass testing events um, where it's necessary. Um, and that's always the goal is to help identify those people that would be positive that maybe don't show any symptoms or um, otherwise don't, um, you know, don't come in for testing. Um, the 24% positivity rate, again, that's preliminary. Um, you know, we've seen um, other situations involving um, other similar types of, of folks that work together very closely um, where we've seen much higher test, you know, positive rates. So I think um, I was pleased that it wasn't higher than 24%, um, but um, I'm so, still glad that we were able to identify these people, help them stay at home, stay away from other people, and, and get better. Um, our cases are going down, um, even from our mass testing um, high of 232 positives in one day, down to 84 today. And so I think that's a good sign as well that um, we got in, we got those tests done, and we're going to start to normalize a little bit here um, as we move forward. Thank you. Governor Lee Strubinger, SDPB. Sure, go ahead, Lee. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, why the back and forth between the state and the tribes is uh, sort of playing out in public right now, and what might the timeline for if and when the state brings a lawsuit against the tribes might be, because it doesn't sound like they're going to take those down anytime soon. Well, we've been having conversations for over a month uh, and uh, seeking resolution, so, um, you know, obviously it gets a little bit... Um, tricky with jurisdictional issues when you deal with the state government, federal government, and tribal governments as well. So uh, making sure that we have essential services flowing through these areas that people can travel through, that we're able to bring in gas, supplies, groceries, those kind of things are important. And so that's uh, this type of clarity will be important to make sure that the appropriate action is being taken. I had another question. I've, I've spoken with a lot of folks uh, from from both Pine Ridge and, and Cheyenne River, and I think a lot of the concern uh, why these checkpoints are put up is that their elderly and their culture bearers are, are a really vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. I guess, how would you uh, want elders and culture bearers to think about um, the state trying to move into or requesting access to tribal lands while, it, while a disease sort of hangs in the balance? Well, I've had conversations with them, and I'm concerned about those that would be in the vulnerable population as well. We've helped them actually prepare. Um, we've helped their IHS facilities get supplies and testing equipment that would be necessary, make sure that they have adequate um, personnel in order to respond. We also have um, worked and trained our National Guard to be ready to respond should that be necessary and communicated openly with all of them and held weekly tribal phone calls with them, uh, making sure we heard what their needs were and responded in getting them PPE and getting other resources that they might need to prepare their communities. So it's a big concern for me as well and always has been. Uh, the checkpoints I certainly understand uh, the spirit behind them and have communicated that if they wanted to do that type of activity on BIA roads, it would be um, less of a jurisdictional issue. Uh, on U.S. and state highways, it's different, and we need to have clarity on, on that situation and that for me, it's a priority that we make sure that if somebody needs an ambulance on a reservation, one can get to them. And I'm not sure of that today with these checkpoints operating the way that they are and with the stories that we've heard. I want to make sure I can get groceries to families and communities on reservations. Uh, I'm not sure that that can happen today at some of these checkpoints that people are running into. So 
making sure that those essential services can go, go through and that those individuals who have property or cattle or live in tribal lands can get home and get to their belongings is important and um, that we continue to make sure that that's facilitated. So that's why you've seen the conversations and the letters and the hope that we can have a resolution soon. I'm sorry, I don't know who this was. This is Claudia Contreras. Okay, go ahead, one. Claudia. Yep, go ahead. So obviously there's kind of been this divide between, I guess, tribe and state for some time about several different issues. How do you think this can hurt the state and possibly hurt the future of South Dakota? I don't feel there has been a divide, Claudia. I guess for me, um, I've worked very well with um, our tribes, um, and I know some, uh, there have been uh, stories focused on that have been negative, but yet we have worked very well on addressing meth on all of their tribal areas and gotten volunteers and veterans organizations to help protect their communities from drugs and from the trafficking of drugs through their areas. We've worked very well on the missing, murdered, and indigenous women issues and passed bills and laws to give us more data and transparency so that we could adequately go after those issues. Uh, we also have worked on an education bill this year that I thought was a really big deal uh, for kids that don't have access to more opportunities for education and, and to learn their culture in our tribal areas that was one of the main priorities coming for our tribes that me and my office helped facilitate get through the process and get signed into law. So that would be there. I've worked hard on foster care and, and social service training that so many of our families in these areas would like to have help on. And then I've championed getting them health care reforms and getting IHS to make sure uh, that they were adequately taking care of the people in these areas that they're responsible for and, and working to get reforms there in place and getting the emergency rooms and facilities at Rosebud and Pine Ridge back online. And I've also uh, gone to bat over and over and over again to get them more road funding and to get them more infrastructure funding because they get cheated in the federal formula. So for years I have literally worked um, with our tribes to meet their needs and to do what we can to make sure that we're good partners and um, you know, these checkpoints are something we're going to have to come to resolution on. I've had candid conversations with leaders. Um, there's different actions happening on the ground and we need some clarity. So that's what we're working on and it's unfortunate that there's um, rumors and conversations, but that's why um, I'm here in front of you answering questions is to let you know really what my heart is and what I want to see happen and that's to help the state unify and get through the spread of this virus and protect as many people as we can. Governor Nome? Yes. Hello, this is Dominique Smith one more time from New Center One. Mm -hmm. One more question. Um, so I just want to make sure with, the, with these checkpoints, are you saying that there's essential services that are literally being turned around or are they just being inconvenienced at the checkpoint and are being held up there? Are, are they actually being turned around and not allowed to, to proceed? I'm not going to give specific stories today, but we do have situations where people have tried to just travel through, not stop, and have been turned around. We do have people that have been going to these areas that have been involved in essential services that have not been allowed to go forward. We have people who live uh, in tribal areas and also have property there, such as cattle or ranches, and they're not allowed to go there and check on their property or to do normal day-to-day -day business. Um, we have to continue to facilitate a situation where essential services can get through. Uh, and uh, we can't have uh, situations where in the future we have an ambulance or a doctor, somebody that needs to get through a checkpoint to help someone and it's not able to be facilitated through a checkpoint. So um, these, there has been situations that, and we need clarity, and that is one of the reasons that you're seeing the actions being taken that are. Okay. Governor, no, this is Hi, Ariel, one more time. Um, so if you are confident that essential services will be allowed through, will you therefore then allow the checkpoints on states and federal highways? I don't think checkpoints are a good idea on state and federal highways. I've indicated to the tribes and our team has that it would be important for them to know there's a difference between those highways and BIA roads. 
uh, and that we need to continue to work to find a resolution uh, that makes sure that our laws are upheld and that we're allowing those essential services to go through. Hey, Governor, this is Alex with the Pioneer again. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you. Um, a letter was sent to your office from some uh, legislators in the state, and they expressed some concern about not being involved in the decision-making or the conversations. Uh, some of them actually have tribal lands in their mm -hmm. districts. Uh, can you address that issue at all? Well, we have been holding calls with legislators regularly and have been updating them on situations that we're dealing with across the state of South Dakota um, and answering all of their questions and staying in communication with them. My team, my office staff have been communicating with legislators as well. And so I appreciate their letter and their concerns and we'll continue to work with them to find a resolution to the situation. Thank you. Governor, this is Stephen Gross from AP. Sure, go ahead, Stephen. Uh, so the letter that you referenced um, basically offered some criticism of giving a 48-hour ultimatum and you know, said that the approach could have taken into account kind of culture and history and, and that kind of thing. I'm wondering if you could tell us uh, why did you decide to issue the ultimatum and um, threaten legal action? When did the, uh, where did the criticism come from, Stephen? You said somebody... Oh, from the letter that from the letter that was just referenced um, from the lawmakers. Oh, I see. Okay, um, you know we have been having conversations for over a month with our tribes, and the continue uh, the checkpoints continue to be an issue with uh, folks on the ground. So we're hoping for some resolution soon. Governor, Nome, this is Alex with the Pioneer again, real quick. Sure, Alex. Thank you. Uh, you keep saying that you've had conversations for a month with the tribe. What, what have some of those con conversations consisted of? What are some of the other options that have been discussed? And what brought us to this point now where you have to give an ultimatum and, and threaten legal action? Well, I believe I've covered that, Alex. We've been having, I've personally had conversations with uh, Chairman Frazier over texting and phone calls. We also, my team has visited with other tribal chairmen. Uh, our Secretary of Tribal Affairs, David Flute, has had conversations with them as well. The Department of Transportation has, Department of Public Safety has. Um, my office staff and general counsel have had conversations as well. We've been working towards a resolution and have not found one. Um, and then the memorandum out of BIA gave direction for tribes to come to a resolution with the state and the state to come to resolution with the tribes. And that has not been able to be facilitated either. So um, we know that there are problems on the ground with allowing people through these checkpoints. And so we're seeking clarity and to make sure there is resolution and especially before the situation gets to the point where we're concerned about essential services or supplies getting to people who really do need them. Okay, so discussed in these conversations? I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. You want like specific details and, and that would be um, very difficult for me to give you right now today. So we'll continue to have those conversations if you'd like them. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any further questions, Bob? There are some, uh, some tribes that we have memorandums of understanding with that we do law enforcement partnerships together. Um, not necessarily with all tribes though, but we do have those in place in some areas and they work very well. Uh, Bob's question was regarding highway patrol doing enforcement activities on tribal lands and only if we have an agreement with their tribal law enforcement to work together in partnership. We have those on, on drug enforcement activities or other extradition agreements or other situations where that partnership works very well, maybe with big events they would be hosting. I don't believe we have uh, existing agreements in place with those two tribes. I think that'd be a great question for Tom Hart, my general counsel, to answer for you, Bob, okay. just so I don't misspeak. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.